those things to happen? Why, why does God allow for sickness? Why does he allow for all kind of offense? Why does he allow for misery and misfortune? Why does he allow for poverty and what have you? If he is my Lord and my protector and my Savior and my healer and my ever-present help in time of need, then why, 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 why is our questions. Amen? Amen. We wonder, Amen. why am I going through this marital problem? Why am I going through this cancer, malignant problem, whatever it is. Well, I came to find there's an answer to it. And as I sat there last night, God was just speaking loud and speaking fast, and I was writing quickly. So I want you to go to Genesis chapter 1, in verse 1 through 3. It's a well-known verse that everyone is probably very acquainted with. And, uh, and here it is. It says, in the, in the beginning, God created, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Several things I want you to notice. I want you to, I want you to see why was there darkness on the earth at that moment of time. Well, the Bible tells us and makes it very clear to us in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 10, it tells us here, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Satan, of course, is the dragon. He had won one-third of God's angels over on his side, and now they are in rebellion. They are fighting against the angels of God. And it goes on in verse 8 and says, But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. When Satan lost the battle in the heavenlies, you come to find that he was now kicked down to the earth. And that's for that reason why we find what we read in Genesis chapter 1, the earth was without form and void, and it was empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep. I want you to know that whenever Satan comes into a culture, into a society, into a, into a, a, a country, or into an individual's life, you will find that individual's life will absolutely echo what we see here in Genesis chapter 1. That person's life, or that culture, or that community, or, or, or that, uh, that country, that they will have a life that is void and empty and formless, and there will be darkness in their lives, and they won't know why everything is so miserable. Because when Satan can get a grip on any one individual or country or culture, what he does, he causes it to become a dump. Wherever his presence is, there is nothing more than a dump. And that's what the world, that's what the earth, look like at the very onset. Because it says in Genesis, but it said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, but God came along and said, Let there be light, and the darkness was destroyed. Amen. God said, Let there be light, and the darkness was destroyed. Now we know in John chapter 4, verse 8, the word of God there says that God is love. Amen? We also find out here God is not only love, but God is light. It says in John chapter 8 verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So when you are walking in the love of God, when you are walking with God in the love of God, then you are also going to see that you are going to be walking in the light of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ came as God in, uh, incarnate, so he is God, and when he came, not only did he show immeasurable love, but he showed immeasurable light. Yeah. And so, you know, when you are in love with somebody, did you ever notice if anybody was ever in love when you were first in love with your husband, and now maybe you want to kick him to the curb, but in those early days when you were in love with them, or you were in love with your, your, uh, your, your, you were in love with your wife, okay, you know, you had such a glow about you. You didn't go around like a sourpuss. You didn't go around as if you just uh, 
jumped into a cesspool, you had a glow about you because love and light kind of go and join together. Amen? And so that love will radiate. So what I want to show you, I had shown you very quickly Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 through 3, and I had shown you Revelation chapter 12, and a lot of times when we read the Word of God, we think, well, that was for then. But I want you to know that there's something called exegetical, there's the homiletical. Exegetical, if I don't have these wrong, exe exegetical is when you read something about the time that it was written. Homiletical is when it applies, am I right on this, Brian? Mm -hmm. When it applies to you. So we're going to take, for the moment, this is just something that hit me last night and I start writing it. I want you to know that Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and Revelation chapter 12 also applies to our life. Let me show you, and I wrote it down as the Lord was giving it to me. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 2, 1 and 2, it says, In your, God said, in your beginning, God created you. Even from the beginning in your mother's womb, you won't find this on a board. You were without form and void. And you were born into a world of darkness that is still roaming on the earth. And the Holy Spirit of God was hovering over you, waiting for God to speak life into your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then here came Genesis chapter 3. Genesis verse 3, I'm sorry. Chapter 1 verse 3. Then God did speak over you at a particular moment of time. It could have been when you were 20, 30, 40, maybe 50, I don't know. Only you know the time when now the privilege of salvation was coming to you. And it says here, God said to me, uh, God did speak over you, let there be light. And there was the introduction of the light of Jesus Christ that came into your life and the darkness was removed. The moment you got saved, you are now a new creation in Christ Jesus all things pass away. All things become anew. You should not be walking in darkness, living in darkness, and living in a dump. You should be living in the light of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And that's really what, how this applies to our lives. Now, we know that we have an enemy of our soul. We know that Revelation chapter 12, if you read further on, and I didn't write it down, but it goes on and it says that Satan knows that his time is short. He's very furious. And he knows that we are the wrap-up generation, and he's going to hit us with everything he can to deflect us off course. Yeah. Amen? But Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me, he who follows me, just because you sit in the church doesn't make you a Christian. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of of life. Amen. So even though we can avoid walking in darkness, the question is, why does God allow for darkness to appear in our lives? Anybody ever ask that question? Here's a simple answer. I didn't have a lot of time to put a whole lot of beautiful stuff behind it and fluff it up, but here's the simplicity in the answer. It's that His glory can not only be seen, but also be touched and to be appreciated. Amen. So the glory of God will be seen by you. And we're going to be getting a little deeper into that. Amen? So in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 through 3, the great Solomon, the wise, the wise and powerful Solomon, he was inspired by God to write that there are differences and oppositions in life, whether we like it or not. Because there he says, in verse 1 through 3, he said, To everything there is a season, a time for every for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, I kind of put this in my own words here, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to laugh, a time to cry, yeah. a time to, to sow and a time to reap, a time to be happy, a time to be sad, uh, a, a, time to, uh, uh, a time to laugh and a time to cry. In other words, there are changes in seasons whether we like it or not, whether we like it or not. But when you have an episode of a season in your life where you are sad, that doesn't bring a lot of joy and happiness to you, does it? When you are coming to a place where you are, where there's death, not your death, you wouldn't be able to feel it, but somebody died, you would, it would be not, it wouldn't be a pleasurable time. Those are times when there's the bleakness and the darkness that is in your life. But, 
But when you understand that you would never have an appreciation for joy if there wasn't misery. That's why we have opposites. You would never have an appreciation for prosperity if there wasn't poverty. You would never have an appreciation for health if there wasn't sickness. You would never have an appreciation for, uh, for peace and joy if there wasn't upset. Amen? So we come to find that there are opposites in life whether we like it or not. But you would never have an appreciation for the glory of God if there wasn't if there wasn't darkness. If there wasn't darkness. John, in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus lets us know, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you live in, you will have tribulation. You will have a lot of offenses. You will have a lot of trials, a lot of suffering, a lot of, a lot of problems. But Jesus said, But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Who has overcome the world? Jesus. Yes, we know Jesus. But love and light has overcome the world. Jesus is God. He is love. He is light. And therefore, He brings love. He brings light. And He sheds that love and that light on our problem and he drives away the darkness for you to see the glory of God in through the whole circumstance. Amen? Just like Genesis chapter 3. God said, I am the light of the world. He spoke and said, let there be light and therefore the darkness was remiss. So if you're living in Christ, you will have problems. But the difference will be if you're living in Christ, if you're living in Christ, Yes, you will have problems, but they won't have you. They won't have an attachment whatsoever over your life. So we now know that God allows darkness to appear in our lives, and we now know why for His glory to be seen. Amen? I want you to catch this verse because this is a powerful verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. How are you doing back there, Tyler? Good, okay. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. It is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I want to say that slow so you catch it, okay? It is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, what, what Paul is saying here as he wrote this scripture and was inspired by God to write this scripture for all generations, whenever you are going through a very bleak, a very dark, a very gloomy moment, when it seems like God is so far from you, if you are living in Christ and you are being true to Christ, and hold on to the peace of Christ, and knowing that He is love and He is light, then all of a sudden, you may not even understand what's happening, but in due season, all of a sudden, there's going to be a little sparkle of light, a little sparkle of hope. Something is going to break loose. It may be so minute, you wonder, did I catch something? Did I see something? But that light is going to get greater and greater and greater and greater. The darker the dark the more outstanding will be the light of His glory that will show, be shown in the midst of your darkest hour. Amen? Of your darkest hour. So we come to find that every time darkness shows up, God allows it so that His glory can be witnessed. And that's kind of the, the main uh, crutch of what I want, crux of what I want to share with you this morning. Darkness is necessary so that the glory of God will be seen. Just like a jeweler. Do you ever go into a jewelry shop and you want to buy a, a diamond ring? You know, you want to buy a $5,000 diamond ring. Did you ever say, let me see that ring. Did you ever see that a jeweler will take the ring and just throw it up on the counter? Doesn't do that, does it? Do they? They take a black cloth and they use it as a backdrop. So that when you see the beauty of that diamond, the blackness of the backdrop emulates the beauty of the diamond. That's how they get you. Okay? Well, I want you to know your moments of 
discomfort, your moments of distraction, your moments of tribulation and trials that come your way. They're nothing more than God has allowed it to be the backdrop because He's about to show you something Hallelujah. glorious. Amen. He is our heavenly jeweler. And He's going to show you the jewels of heaven, which is His Son. And He's going to let you see how brilliant, how glorious, and how immaculate He is. And the only way you're going to see Him is when you are going through a problem. I used to live in Las Vegas. We used to swim 100 degrees temperature, sometimes 105. We'd get in that swimming pool and we'd stay in there because we were frying. You have two choices, stay outside and swim or stay inside and not enjoy the outside. But as we were swimming, you could look around the outside perimeter of, of, of Las Vegas. You could see the mountains, and on top of the mountains, you could see snow. <laughs> so what we did one day, we all got together, we came out of our pool, we uh, dried off, we put on warm clothes, winter clothes, we got in a car, it was about a 45 minute drive, and as we drove toward the mountaintop, as we started, because in Las Vegas there's no natural vegetation, no trees, nothing grows in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. But as we were going up that mountaintop, the trees were about this thin, and they started to get a little thicker, a little thicker, a little thicker. By the time, maybe an hour's drive, we got up to the top in the region of the mountain. We got in about six to seven inches, sometimes 12 inches of snow. We, would, we were playing tackle football. We were freezing. We were throwing snowballs at each other. It was like two different lives in the same day. And then we would come down after we were so cold we couldn't stand it anymore. We'd come down and we would be able to, we would be able to enjoy going back and swimming again and dying of the heat and the exhaustion of the heat. I want you to know that's kind of what it's like when you are really truly serving Christ. When you are allowing for Jesus Christ to come and shine in the midst of the darkness. You are not going to, you are not going to enjoy anything down in the valley. You're not going to enjoy anything in the valley. That's where you grow. That's where the darkness resides. That's where you have to live and the darkness comes but God begins to show you a glimpse of a mountaintop. He begins to show you how you're going to have joy unspeakable on that mountaintop. Amen. But it's not going to come right away. You have to be patient. You have to be patient that the Lord will come about upon you. And the Lord will bring you through because he's growing you through some things. A lot of people say, I want to live on the mountaintop. No, you don't. Because you're not going to grow on a mountaintop. You're going to be able to enjoy the mountaintop, but you're not going to grow there. It's when you're in the valleys of life, when you're in the, when you're going through the, the, the ruts and, and the, the little difficulties of life, that's where you are going to grow. Amen? Amen. Amen? And so with all that said, just give me a few more moments and let me show you how his light, how his glory had shown up in the darkest of hours. So remember 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. One of the darkest moments in the history of humanity is found over there in Genesis, around Genesis chapter 9. It was the flood. The flood came. God had had enough. God had had enough, and he said, I'm not putting up with it anymore because they have mocked me, they ridicule me, they don't believe in me. So he gets a man by the name of, as you know, he gets a man by the name of Noah, and for over a hundred years, Noah is building a boat. And he's going into the city every night as he puts the hammer down, he and his three sons, and he's going into the city and he's preaching about God's plan of salvation, that they need to turn their hearts around, but they mock God, they laughed at Noah, they ridiculed Noah, and God knew, I've had enough, and therefore God brought the flood. Now, when he was telling these people, it's going to rain, they were laughing and said, yeah, it's going to what? Because there was no such thing as rain in that day. For the earth to be watered, it was watered through natural springs and underground rivers. But there was never any rain that ever came down from the heavens. But of course, you know, when the rain started to come, God brought the animals, God brought Noah, his wife, his three sons, his three daughter-in-laws, they got into the boat, and God closed the door. When the floods came, it wiped out all of mankind. All the animals that were still left on the earth. Everything was gone. And then when the boat had finally resided, 
You come to find in Genesis chapter 9, I want you to see this, verse 11 through 16. Thus I establish my covenant with you, God says to Noah. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, verse 12, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be, put that fan on please, it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. What are we talking about here? We're talking about a rainbow. A rainbow. A rainbow is God's promising vow to never destroy mankind in such a way ever again. The rainbow is made up of a myriad of colors. I mean it has the most beautiful colorful decorations. The, the most beautiful greens and yellows and oranges and, and turquoise, reds and yellows. You look at, a, at, at a, a rainbow and you will find that it is made up of all these beautiful colors. But here you come to find that God said, I am going to place a sign in the sky and that sign in the sky is going to come every time there is a windstorm that has brought what? Darkness. Darkness is necessary for the glory of God to be seen, right? So when the darkness of a cloud storm, a rainstorm, a darkened cloud comes, then you see the visuality of a rainbow. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And by the way, the, the multicoloration of the rainbow signifies the multifaceted expression of the love and of the light and of the glory and of the mercy of Jesus Christ. He has, he has many titles. Lord, God, Savior, King, Mighty Counselor. He is our friend. He is our, uh, he is our, uh, uh, um, he is our provider, protector. He is the darling of heaven, the bright and morning star. He's the noonday sun. On and on and on are all the wonderful accolades of titles that Jesus Christ has. So when you see, I'm trying to get you to understand this, when you see a rainbow, it is actually a signification. You are seeing the resemblance of Christ. Amen. That's who's there in the rainbow. It's a knowledge that Jesus Christ is our heavenly rainbow, that he has made a promise, I'll never do this again. And that's why Jesus turned around and said, that I have come that none shall be lost. None shall ever die. Because that covenant that was made by God is going to be upheld by the rainbow of heaven, who is none other than Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let me tell you something. When I was at East Moline many years ago, and I'm preaching, on a, I was preaching six days there, one of the evening services, a man walks in, I think it was Sunday night to be honest with you, a man walks in totally inebriated. I wasn't sure how they were going to handle him. Here, his wife just started coming to church. She looked like a battered woman. And she's sitting in the back of the church, and few people even have known her because they just start, he, she just started coming to church. He walks in. He is, he is bouncing. He can't walk a straight line, and he sits near her. And I could see, because I'm preaching, I could see she didn't want him near her, so she's kind of like, get away from me. But he comes in. And when there was a time for an altar call, he comes staggering up to the front. The pastor, knowing that there's going to be probably a problem here, he come over to stay with me. I didn't even touch this man. I turned around and I wanted to pray with him. He went down in the spirit. He went out like a light. And he was gone. Now how long did he go? They intended to take me out that night to have some pie and some cake and some coffee. You know, a few of the elders, the pastor, his wife, and such. And generally speaking, it takes maybe a half an hour to close up the church and everybody's out of there and we can get going. This guy was still laying on the floor. He was, he was laid out to the point. Almost an hour went by. They finally, the elders came and the pastor got them to grab him, his limp body, carry him out, put him in the back seat of her car, 
drive him home, they followed her, and then they took him out of the car and put him in bed, and that's all I heard the next morning from the pastor. He shows up the next night. When he shows up the next night, he is sober as sober could be. And he came to the front for another time of prayer, and he said, let me tell you something. He said, I don't know what hit me, but when I went down on the floor, I saw the most crisp, the most riches of colors. I saw the reddest red, the most beautiful green, the most unbelievable yellow. He was mentioning all these colors. And of course, at the time, God didn't give this to me. And I'm thinking, wow, okay? But you know what? That man, long story short, over the many months later, he became an elder in the church. He is absolutely acknowledging of the Word of God. He is there. He has found his gift. He's in the gift of helps. He's there. He takes care of anything and everything the church has need of. And he has been baptized in the Holy Ghost. He has the ability to speak in other tongues. I mean to tell you, what a change. Amen? Amen. So he received total intimate identification of Jesus Christ, the rainbow of heaven that touched his life. The Second Chronicles is another episode. A time where the children of Israel were living in a very darkened moment because they were in an unbelievable uh, apostasy and they were into idolatry. Solomon was the king at the time and God had inspired Solomon. I want you to, I want you to go ahead and I want you to be, rebuild the, uh, the temple. Solomon did. When he rebuilt the temple, God gave Solomon and the people a word of hope, which was a light of hope. Sometimes that light will come in the form of a word from the Father's mouth. Here came a light of hope. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. You all know it. If my people who are called by my name, speak it with me, say it with me. If my people who are called by my name will humble, them, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and have sanctified this house that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. And that promise that God had given to the nation of Israel was not only given for their benefit, to see their culture, their country healed, God has given it to you and to, uh, to me. Yeah. Whenever darkness has prevailed over our nation, we shouldn't be boo-hooing and saying, now what are we going to do? No, it is the backdrop because God is about to do something powerful, you're about to see a magnificent display of the glory of God invading the, 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 the community, the culture, the country, and it's going to come because we are praying together, asking for forgiveness of our country, the sins of our country, not just our own, and turning from our wicked ways, and turning to the Lord, and allowing for God to be God. Can you say amen? Amen. So Jesus, here's another episode, I'm almost done. Stay with me. Jesus, he's hanging, he is the light of the world, hanging on the cross. I didn't know I had so much stuff. I mean, I was writing like a fool here. Yes. He is the light of the world, hanging on the cross. And in Luke chapter 23, verse 39 through 43, it said one of the criminals who were, hang, who were hanging, blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. He's innocent. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said to him in verse 43, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You have two criminals. One was mocking God. One was, re 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 he was rebuking Christ. He was, uh, he was joining, what he did, he joined the crowd. He saw that the crowd was having a wonderful time spitting on Jesus, mocking Jesus, laughing at him. If you are the Son of God, take yourself down. And that's what this criminal had said. What he thought was, the Roman government will think that I'm on their side, maybe they'll set me free, but that didn't happen. The other criminal turned around and said, are you kidding me? Do you not even fear God? We have the justification to us for what we have done. This man has done nothing to deserve this. He's innocent. And then he turned to Christ and he said, he said something to Jesus. He asked him a question. Please remember me 
when you come into your kingdom. But why did he say that? Because Jesus, the light of the world, was there. This criminal had the darkest moment of his life. How would you feel if you were hanging knowing that they were about to kill you? Wouldn't be, let's go dancing. Wouldn't be, let's put a smile on our face. It would be dark, gloomy, and petrifying. That's where this guy's at. Obviously, when he committed the crime, probably committed many crimes, he always got away with it. As long as he was committing the crime, he thought he was good to go. But in this particular instance, obviously the law caught up to him. Now he was arrested, now he was prosecuted, and now he's going to be condemned to die by hanging. So here he's got to be absolutely beside himself with fear and anguish. He's concerned, he doesn't know what to do. But he turns to Christ and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Why? Because his heart was open. His heart was open to Christ. And the light of this world, who was none other than Jesus Christ, the love of God himself, came emitting love and light into the heart of this convicted criminal. And then all of a sudden, Jesus said to him, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Not maybe, I hope you make it. No, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Remember what Jesus said, John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus, with that statement, he gave him light, he gave him hope, he gave him peace. And Jesus drove away the darkness of anxiety and fear and gave him a bonus that you are going to have eternal life. But that all came because of the dark episode, the black, the, 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 the backboard of the darkness to see the glory of God that was about to be displayed right before his eyes talking about the criminal. And, and another, and I'm almost done here, Jesus' death on the cross, glory was about to be seen in the backdrop of darkness. Luke chapter 23, verse 44 and 47, through 47. It was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Now I want to go over this again real quick here. It says, now about the sixth hour, there was darkness, everybody say darkness, darkness. over all the earth. Not just over Jerusalem, not just over Israel. God had made sure darkness was going to be over all the earth. And then it goes on and says, the sun, verse 45, the sun was darkened. Not only was there darkness over all the earth, now the sun, God shut the sun off. Which means he shut the stars off. Which means you could not have you could not have seen your hand in front of your face. That's how dark it had to have been. God shut everything off. Why? Because God was about to bring a glorious manifestation that the world would never have seen. Amen. So darkness always precedes a miracle. Always precedes the glory of God. What happened? Then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Jesus gave up the ghost. When that happened, an earth, earthquake came. When the earthquake hit, then the, the temple, first of all, the temple was cut from the top to the bottom. Why? Because Jesus Christ made a way that you and I would have access to go before the Father. Because in the Old Testament, the law was only the high priest could ever go into the Holy of Holies. No other person was ever allowed in the Holy of Holies but only the high priest. If anybody else tried to go in, and if they didn't have the blood of, of, of a sheep or a bull, then they would die immediately. But what Jesus Christ did, when he gave up the ghost, he, the, the God Almighty himself tore the veil, that was the veil that went behind or confronted the, the Holy of Holies. That means you and I now have the privilege to go in to the throne room of God with great boldness and say to our Heavenly Father, not just say Heavenly Father, but Daddy God, you are my Daddy. You are my support. I'm dependent completely 
on you. When that earthquake also hit, all the graves opened up. Let me show you how powerful this is. All the graves opened up, and all the dead came back to life, and they went back into the city, and everybody knew who they were. You talk about the glory of God, and the glory of God, it's just like seeing the ocean. You know, the, the higher the, the waves that come in, the stronger the, uh, the ebb tide goes out, and you've got to be careful sometimes. Well, the greater the miracle, the darker the dark. The darker the dark that's going to come. And that's what's happening here with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So God tore the veil in two. He tore the veil in two for those whose hearts were open to see it then, and for those of us whose hearts are open to see it now. And my last example was found in John chapter 20, verse 1. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark. While it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So we come to find Jesus arose in the darkness. He died in the darkness, gave up his spirit so as to show his glory in the darkness, and now we come to find he arose in the darkness. After he had accomplished everything that he needed to accomplish behind that, that, that uh, enclosed tomb, he went into the pits of hell, and he let Satan know, your feet, you're defeated, you're finished, and then he captured all the saints of the Old Testament in his train and brought them up to heaven. When he had concluded the, 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 uh, the campaign that God had given him the, to conclude, then and only then did he come out of that tomb. Did he come out of that grave? Did he come out of that cave? Amen? And no longer was there a need for darkness because the darkness was the backdrop of what was about to take place. Jesus Christ the only God that other men try to serve, they try to worship so many gods. He's the only one that ever overcame the sting of death in the grave. He's the only one that came back to life. And it was such a powerful move that it also needed the backdrop of darkness. The backdrop of darkness. You know, some of you are in a cave. Some of you may be incarcerated. Some of you are so incarcerated, you don't know what to do. And you're, you're wondering, you know, my marriage is on the rocks, my finances are on the rocks, my health is an issue, I, I have marital unstable un uh, instability, I have children problems, grandchildren problems, they took my grandchildren away, I've got all these problems. And instead of you boo-hooing, instead of you turning around and start cussing and fussing, what you have to do is you have to get your eyes affixed on Christ. Amen. If you abide in Him, He said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, then what? Ask whatever you ask in my name, and I will do it for you. I will do it for you. And you will have peace. You will live in peace, and he will give you new life. Amen? Amen. He will give you new life. So we come to find the darkness. The darkness was not able to hold Jesus back. It was the backdrop for the glory that was about to be seen. So this issue leads to a dark, gloomy mindset, unless you apply John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you have, may have peace, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I, the light of the world, the love of God, have overcome the world. Amen? Amen. And don't forget 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, where it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The whole reason why God allows darkness, a darkened situation, a gloomy a gloomy, seems like hopeless situation to now all of a sudden prevail is because he's about to show you something that's going to blow your mind. He's about to let you see something that is going to bring glory like you've never seen before. He is about to absolutely, and only God is going to get the glory for it because only he can do what he's about to do. So the darker your dark moment is, the more magnificent your miracle is going to become. The Bible makes it very clear. It says in Psalm chapter 30, verse 5, weeping is but for a season. Weeping is gloomy. Weeping is dark. Weeping is tiring. But joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning hour. And that joy is unspeakable. You won't be able to tell people what it's about. And it's full of glory. Amen? So we need to have that understanding of that backdrop. And finally, 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 can I have one more second of your time? Acts chapter 1, verse 9. 
Now Jesus Christ is about to be rose up into the heavens. It says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Anybody getting that? A cloud received him. You know why they were able to see him? You know why they were able to witness this mighty, powerful thing where Christ in all of his human form was now being lifted up because he was being lifted up with the backdrop of a cloud. If you go back into Genesis chapter 9, and there, as you remember, verse 14, it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. I want you to know that Jesus Christ is the rainbow of heaven. He is the multifaceted expression of the love, the mercy, the glory of God. Anything and everything that you will ever have need of in your life, Jesus Christ is that person, that thing that you will ever need. And He is there for you. And He wants you to know, I am going to draw away the darkness. And when I come as light, when I come as love, I am going to give you the most beautiful reds, the most beautiful greens. I'm going to inspire you and tell you just go and sit by the, by the, the river and be at peace. Be in joy. Have joy in your heart. Because the battle's mine. The battle's not yours. You don't have to worry about a thing. I'm going to take care of you. Can you say amen? Would you stand with me and give the Lord a shout of praise? Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord God. We thank you for what you're doing, Lord God, for what you're doing in this house, what you're doing with your people. Lord, we just thank you and praise you. I don't even know how much more to say it, Father. But I'm going to ask that if there's somebody that's needing prayer, I want to pray with you. I don't want to be a miss on, on this. I want, I want to be able to pray with you. And we're going to see that God is going to move and God is going to change the matter of fact. If you're living in a place now where there's darkness glooming all around you, that's a good place to be. Because it means that all you need to do is keep your eyes peered on Jesus Christ. If you abide in Him and allow for His Word to abide in you, you are about to see a miracle that's about to break through. And God is going to let that darkness get even more gloomy because the, the power of that miracle is going to be that much more sensational. So whatever it is you have need of, if you want to come up here, I'm going to pray with you very quickly. And we are going to see the, uh, the, the, the Lord is going to just transpose things. He's going to move you out of the misery and He's going to bring joy unspeakable. Into your life. If there's anybody that has need, come up here.